to be a rebel is, is to walk with Christ and, and to be outside the box. And a rebel, I think, is, is a warrior. Uh, things didn't seem joyful in the beginning, but as I learned to know who God was and, and got to be closer to Him, I now have joy. I gave my life to Christ, and the last six years, six and a half years, my life has been a complete 180. He's the truth, the way, the life, and He has given me life. My heart and my soul has been completely transformed because of what Christ has done for me. I realize this is an inside game. You know, I've got to surrender my heart, my life every day, and I gotta, I gotta know what my heart's really looking for, and that's true connection with a God that loves me and true connection with the people He's put in my life for this moment today. The fellowship and accountability for other men that have gone through the same things I've gone through is what's really helped me. You have to be that rebel to, to get closer to him. I learned how to be willing to admit defeat to win the battle. So if we can start fixing men, start getting men to be the men they were designed to be, born to be, then I think we're going to start to see real change. All right, guys, I'm just going to give you a little bit uh, introduction on Tony. Now, you, you guys all know who he is, but just want to give a little of his past life. He, uh, he was a f uh, former offensive lineman for Green Bay in Indianapolis, uh, twice appearing on the, the cover of Sports Illustrated in 89 and 92, as well as being a two-time AP All-American at Michigan State in 87-88. Uh, Tony was a two-time two Big Ten Lineman of the Year, 87 and 88, and he was the only college football player ever to be named on the All-Madden team, which is for NFL players only. Um, and the thing is, Tony doesn't even care about that now. Um, it's just part of his life, and I've spent uh, three, I had three days at your office, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, I walked in and I, he, I said, holy crap, this guy is a monster. He's going to rip my arm off. Uh, but he is a gentle giant and a wonderful man and truly humble. And he's been through so much. I'll let him talk about his life. But um, he's the real deal. And I'm just proud to call him my friend. Everybody give Tony Mandrich a big hand. I'll go get you a water. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. I feel like saying, <laughs> my name's Tony, I'm an alcoholic. Because <laughs> of all the AA meetings over almost 20 years now. Um, Rick, thanks for having me, thanks for asking. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here to be able to share my story with you guys. Um, it's pretty raw. Uh, you know, you, you, I think the video, Rick had mentioned it the other day, he said, should we, he said, should we play the video? It's nine minutes long, and, and I, it really explains a lot of things in a linear time fashion. So I don't have to sit here and explain what all happened. You kind of see what happened. I mean, it was a train wreck. It was a train wreck with some redemption. And, um, the, you know, the biggest thing, thank you. The biggest thing was... Um, the redemption right it's like that was the crucial part that was that was the crucial part besides the getting sober which you can call an act of providence an act of god uh whatever you want to call it um besides the, that fact of sobriety the miracle of sobriety happening coming back to play was so crucial because I thought it was impossible. Um, for years I had accepted the fact that I was an alcoholic and a drug addict. Um, you know, I was born and raised Catholic. I, I, I never, I was an altar boy for 11 years, went to church every Sunday, had a great, great childhood, awesome parents. Um, didn't have everything we wanted, but we had everything we needed. Um, and, you know, when I really at 11 years old, you know, I lived in, grew up in Toronto, Southern Ontario, so I'm 45 minutes from Buffalo, three hours from Detroit. So, and back then in the 1970s, late 70s, 
you know, you only get so many channels, um, so we would always get the Bills or the Lions. Or for football, you'd get the University of Michigan, which is... <laughs> I always say someday I'll be on a surgeon's table getting heart surgery from a graduate from the University of Michigan probably, and I hope he doesn't find out I'm a Spartan. <laughs> um, so we'd watch University of Michigan or Ohio State, those were like the, the, the big schools. And um, my, at, at 11, I, and I don't know why, it was like 11, 12 years old, I had this conviction in me that I, I made a decision. I said, I'm going to play in the NFL, and from here on forward, um, I made a plan, and I put it down on paper, and I said, this is what I need to do, and then I had short-term and long-term goals, this is what I need to do to get to the next level, this is what I need to do, and then you get there, and then new goals to get to the next level. Well, when you're 11 years old, you know, my youngest daughter will be 17 in about two weeks. Well, when she was 11, just, you know, four, five, six years ago, and I looked at her maturity level, just an 11 year old's maturity level, I was shocked that at that time that I had made a decision, a career decision. And it wasn't just a pipe dream, it was like, no, this is gonna happen. Obviously there has to be a lot of luck that has to happen, you can't get hurt, you know, can't get ill, can't get sick, a lot of luck has to happen, a lot of pieces have to fall into place. But I made that plan and I said to myself, every decision I make from here on forward, if it's a major decision, or even if it's a minor decision, if it's a, if it's a detail, I'm gonna ask myself, is this getting me closer to the NFL or is this being a distraction to get to the NFL? And I did that. And I knew my goals were to do well in school because I knew if I didn't do well in school, I wouldn't be able to play football on the football field, wouldn't be eligible. So, you know, I wasn't a straight A student but I knew that I had to study and I knew I had to participate. I knew that it wasn't just football. I knew I went out of my way to, go, to do wrestling in high school because it's good for grappling and it's good if you're an offensive lineman, okay? And even at that point, you know, I wasn't naive enough to think I was gonna play a specialty position because I was already like 240, 235, 240 in the ninth grade and just, you know, not, you know, not a burner as far as speed goes. <laughs> so, I mean, I was being realistic. Um, so, you know, as you go through high school, you said, you know, I was setting goals and then meeting them, setting goals and meeting them. And in Canada at that time, there wasn't much recruiting um, from, co from U.S. colleges just because it was a, just a different era. Now there's a lot because there's some great athletes in Canada. Um, so my senior year of high school, I moved down to Ohio and lived with my brother who went to Kent State University and I went to Kent Roosevelt High School for the sole purpose of getting my senior year in the U.S. to get exposure um, by scouts um, from, from U.S. colleges and to try to get a scholarship because, and that was part of the plan. And if you think about it, I left home when I was 15 years old. We had to go to court, my parents had to sign off so my brother could take guardianship. So I was leaving a country, even though it was Canada, coming to the US, it's not like you're going to you know, Afghanistan or somewhere like across the world, you're going to a country that's very similar, but still at 15 years old, you're leaving your, you know, your mom and dad for the purpose of a dream that you have. So I was willing to go to any lengths. And I did that and reset up the goals, went through my senior year at Kent Roosevelt. And my dream at the time was to play for Ohio State. Um, I was always a fan of theirs. And for some reason, I got offers from Michigan. I got offers from Michigan State. I got offers from UCLA. I got offers from all big, like a lot of big schools, just as big as Ohio State. And they didn't offer me. I don't know why, but they didn't offer me. So 
Um, I went, you know, my best place, my next best place to go was Michigan State, and I swore that Ohio State was going to pay for it, <laughs> and then they did. Um, and they're, you know, they're a great institution, but um, you obviously play a little extra, you know, with a little bit extra shove at the end of the play, um, as you do at Michigan. Um, so you get to college, and my freshman year of college, and at this point, there's no steroids, there's no, I, I was never drunk to this point yet. I was never, never, I had a beer or two, was the most I'd ever have is a beer or two. Went through my whole high school, four years of high school, um, went to some parties, never got drunk, never smoked dope, never did any drugs, never did steroids. I got to college and kind of got introduced to all that stuff because there's so much of it in the college atmosphere. And uh, my freshman year at Michigan State, it looked like I was going to get redshirted, so I wasn't going to play. And when I got to Michigan State and we played Notre Dame at home, you know, it was, it was like a dream come true because you're playing the fighting Irish and you're like, this is the team I've watched all my life on TV. And I'm going, this is actually happening. You know, even though I'm not in the game, I'm dressed and I'm on the sideline and I'm going, this is happening. And I don't know if you guys remember a guy named Mark Bavaro. Okay. He was a tight end. When I saw the size of Mark Bavaro, and he was a tight end, and I thought, oh my God, if he's that big and he's a tight end, I've got a lot of work to do. And, and part of that was um, willing to go to any lengths. Okay, so now willing to go to any lengths was starting to turn into a vice. It was like, I'll do anything to be the best. So I started taking steroids. And, you know, luckily enough, and I say luckily enough because it probably didn't damage my body as bad as some people do with chemicals like that. I had a guy that lived in California who was Mr. America at the time in bodybuilding, and he was very educated and very well, um, really knew his knowledge on steroids. And his theory was you take multiple steroids, you take three, four, five st different steroids, but you take them at extremely low doses. And in a nine month period, I just blew up. I went from like two, 280, you know, and just a big guy to 310 and just all muscle in about a nine month period. And, you know, and, and, and it's not, you don't just take it and it happens. You've, I mean, you've got to work, right? Because if you just, you know, took it and it happened, you wouldn't have any fat people in the world, right? <laughs> I mean, if, if you ever invent that drug, you're going to make a lot of money, okay? Probably even more than Viagra. So, so I, I start, you know, taking it, getting big, doing well in college, um, writing my goals. And, 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 and when I wrote my goals my freshman year at Michigan State, um, I wrote kind of, <clears throat> kind of like stepping stone goals. First it was to become a starter. Well, actually, first it was to become on the traveling squad. It means that if you go to away games, they take you. Then it was to become a starter. Then it was to become um, all Big Ten. Uh, then it was to become all American. Then it was to win the Outland Trophy. Then it was to be the first pick in the draft. And my roommate, a uh, great guy, he was saying, uh, well, you know, what are you doing there? I said, I'm just writing down my goals for my college over the next five years. And he's like, well, you know, what are they? And he, he wasn't being a smart ass or anything. He was, he was a good guy. And his, his dad is in, I think he's in the NFL Hall of Fame. His brother played in the NFL for 12 years. Um, so this guy was around football and, and he's a great guy. And um, so he said, well, what are they? So I read, you know, the traveling team and he's like, yeah. And then I read the become a starter by next year. And he's like, 
probably because the guy in front of you is graduating. He goes in, unless you just lay an egg, you're not going to start. And I said, all Big Ten by my third year. And he's like, that's going to be hard because there's a lot of good teams in the Big Ten. And if you're going to be one of two of the best in the Big Ten, I mean, you're pretty good. And then he said, all American. He said, eh, pipe dream especially being from Canada. And then, and then when he said, number one player in the draft, he said, can you please repeat that? <laughs> and I said, I'm gonna be the number one player taken in the draft. And he busted out laughing. And he said, and he said, I'm not laughing at you. He goes, it's just, he goes, there's just one guy a year. It's just one guy a year. And you know what I said? I said, why not me? Why, why not that guy be me? And I said the same thing sitting in a treatment center in 1995 in Detroit, Michigan, in the back row, thinking to myself, what a pathetic loser I am. I had Tony's greatest plans of building his empire got me into a treatment center in the back row and they had all these people stand up that were in treatment probably 40 or 50 of us and they said okay and they were doing a statistic thing they said the, the first two or three rows sit down and they said uh, <clears throat> these people won't be sober longer than 30 days these are statistics so then the next row next amount of people sit down and it came down to like 1%. One out of 100 will stay sober the rest of their life. And I thought to myself, why not me? Right? Okay. I wasn't the first player taken in the draft because Dallas needed a quarterback. Okay. He was pretty good. Troy Aikman. He was all right. He did, he did all right. I, th I think he did all right. He was a starter. <laughs> The guy they drafted behind me did pretty decent, Barry Sanders. I mean, he ran pretty good at concut and slash in the Hall of Fame, along with Troy. Fourth guy drafted, Derek Thomas. Set NFL records for sacks and games. One of the best outside linebackers probably to play, play defensive end outside linebacker. Phenomenal athlete in the Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, he passed away from a car accident, I don't know, probably seven, eight years ago in the Hall of Fame. Fifth guy taken, Deion Sanders. He didn't run across the field. He glided across the field. The guy was unbelievable to watch. And he did pretty good. He returned some punts back for touchdowns. He made it to the Hall of Fame, too, and, and was a starter, right? So, they're your top five picks. And, which makes my story to the media even bigger with the failure, because the, uh, the other four are in the Hall of Fame. And, and it's okay, and I'm like, this is okay. Because I went to Green Bay, I was taken where I was supposed to be taken, and I went through the lessons that I needed to go through, and I called Green Bay a, villi you know, a village, which if you want to win friends and influence people, that's not the way to do it. And then when I got to Green Bay, I said, hey, listen, every village needs an idiot. So, you know, I kind of massaged things a little bit. Here comes my plane, because I got to get going. Uh, <laughs> We'll wait for it to pass. Where was I at? Village. Concussions. Concussions. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, I get to Green Bay and, and um, 
I can't do the steroids anymore because the NFL drug testing is a lot more sophisticated than the NCAA was. So it was it was literally almost an overnight switch from steroids to painkillers and alcohol, and drank and drugged for four years there every day. And I wasn't, you know, when I say that, I wasn't a falling down drunk. Like I wasn't like, you know, I just wasn't like. But I was drinking every day. And you saw in the interview, when Bob Lee was interviewing me, I was like slurring my words. And it's like, it's like I look at that and I go, I don't even know who that guy is. It's, it's just a whole different world for me. Um, you know, the most, one of the most embarrassing, embarrassing things of my life, why does it have to be caught on tape, right? In that video, when I say, you know, I'm Tony Mandridge and they're just gonna have to get used to it or like it. I cringe so bad. And it's one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. And I was telling Rick the other day, I said, you know, we all get, we all try to stay grounded, but we're human. We start doing pretty good. We start thinking we're pretty good. We kind of get a little bit cocky. And then what I'll do is I'll go back to my computer and I'll put that video on and I'll watch it and I'll go right back to center and I'll be like, and it gets me regrounded. Um, so I kind of use it as a tool for a positive thing. Um, so, you know, the Green Bay years were a disaster. Um, and uh, all the expectations and all the talk and all that stuff that I was full of, you know, BS and um, was was a lost kid, a lost person um, that was filling the void with a chemical. And um, never at any point did I not believe in God. Never at any point did I blame God for this life, the way I was living. It got to the point where I had accepted that I got the shaft in life. That some people on this earth are put on this earth to be pilots, some are put on to be engineers, some are put on to be surgeons, some are put on to be alcoholics and drug addicts, some are put on to be ditch diggers, whatever. And I got the shaft. I got to be a, an alcoholic or a drug addict. And I accepted it. And I wasn't mad at God. I was just like, that's how I'm going to die. Okay? Because I had tried hundreds of ways, l at least 500 ways to get sober unsuccessfully. Um, there was a time where I would get 100 pills, and I was at, at, towards the end, it was, you know, towards the last six months before, you know, sobriety happened, I was taking 60, 70 painkillers a day. So to get a bottle of 100 last, you're supposed to last you a month. So I had doctors all over different states in the Midwest. I was all networked and stuff. And thank God, you know, the stuff isn't like today with the Walgreens, they'd be all connected. I would have been busted so bad. Um, so I'm thinking to myself, how am I gonna stop? I gotta stop. So I got another great idea. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take nine of them and take them and I'm gonna take the rest of them and I'm gonna drive two miles to my storage facility, public storage facility, put them in my storage facility, lock it up and leave because between midnight and 5 a.m. the storage facility is locked. It doesn't matter if you have a code, nobody gets in or nobody gets out, okay? They've got cameras, they've got barb, razor barbed wire, all that stuff. This is in Michigan. And this is like 10 o'clock at night, so I take my nine and I'm, you know, melting into the couch. And by midnight, I'm like, I want some more pills. And I'm thinking, I have to wait till 5 a.m. And I'm thinking, well, I'll just fall asleep, so 1 a.m. comes. I end up going into the bedroom, grabbing the comforter, driving down two miles to the storage facility, throwing the comforter over the barbed wire, the razor wire, hopping the fence, which was like a 12 foot fence, and you know, walking to my storage facility just like it was middle of the day, unlocking and grabbing my pills, going back, hopping back over, and just tore the heck out of the comforter. And my wife was gonna kill me. Um, but you know, the, the thing had caught on the razor wire and I was pulling on it and I said, screw it, I'm just leaving it. And you know what, this, you know, 
and I look at that story and it is funny but the sad part is five years prior to that I was on the cover of Sports Illustrated and I had the world in the palm of my hands and I by some people's opinion was potentially the best college lineman ever to play the game and here I was five years later hopping a fence so I could feed my addiction and when I look at that and I'm like it can happen and it can happen quicker than five years it can happen in 12 months it can happen in six months so you know I end up getting sober um, you know and, and as the video talked about I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired um, I got tired of myself I got tired of pointing the finger at everybody my mom and dad my brother my kids my wife the media the Packers it was everybody's fault but mine but I was a common denominator but it was everybody's fault so one of my buddies talked to me and he basically had he had said to me the same thing a lot of people had said but for, for some reason this time it clicked and and he said if you don't stop what you're doing you're gonna die and you're gonna be sitting on this couch three just like you've been sitting on this couch for three years and I thought to myself I've been sitting on this couch for three years like like not doing anything since I got left the league in 92 and that hit me like a bat that it was three years because it was a blur it was like a three-year blackout and <clears throat> I went down into Brighton Hospital in, the, in Brighton, Michigan, which is right outside of Detroit, and um, by no means of Beverly Hills of treatment centers. Um, and there was uh, all kinds of people there. There was politicians there, ditch diggers, black people, white people, Asian people, fat people, skinny people, football players, doesn't matter what it was. It didn't discriminate and um did all their stuff and you know i was like i don't know what this is all about uh after at day 11 there was a big thing that happened in the treatment center for me um we were in a in a lounge and it was kind of like our time off and there was about 40 of us in treatment and i'd say 38 of the 40 smoked and the room was just like full of smoke and it's March it's cold out so they got the windows open but I mean you can barely see like the, at the end of the room because there's so much cigarette smoke okay and I was chewing tobacco and the other guy was chewing tobacco so all 40 of us were using nicotine right they take my q-tips away so I, I guess so I don't kill myself with my q-tips but they they let me have the chew so we were, we were sharing stories amongst ourselves. And even though all the occupations were different, all the stories were the same. All the pain was the same. All the shame was the same. All the guilt, all the remorse. All the people we hurt the most were the same. The people that we loved the most. And... We were, you know, a lot of the, and, and a lot of the stories we talked about were funny, right? Like hopping a fence or you hear some other stories. And my eyes were burning um, from all the cigarette smoke. And I was like, I got to go da down to the, my so-called dorm room. It's in a hospital um, just to get out of the smoke. And I sat on the edge of the bed and that's really where I think the miracle happened because there was no bright light but my stomach hurt from laughing for the first time in 10 years and I thought what is going on here I said I haven't laughed without having to take something exterior and put it in a pill or put a needle in my arm or drink something and I was actually laughing at 11 days and I thought well whatever it is I'm digging my nails into it and I'm gonna hang on to it and I still didn't know what it was and it was it was kind of like a you started to realize there was a lot of pressure released off of you or off of me 
because I started to realize there's other sick fuckers out there like me okay I mean I'm not the only one and I thought I was the one that was like I thought I was like the only one that did all this horrendous stuff you know besides serial killers and you know and I had you know and then so it was just crazy and, and I will back up because I did touch on the one part about how we hurt our families the most in, in three months at Christmas time, um, I got sober March 23rd, 1995. And at Christmas time of, of uh, three months prior to that, there was a big incident that happened in my house. Um, my wife at the time was also a, a, an active alcoholic and drug addict. And we had a two, two and a half, three year old girl. And um, we were fighting about something and she made, uh, she was making dinner and she kind of threw, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to watch TV and she's going to bring me the dinner on the coffee table because I want to watch ESPN or whatever. And it was steak and she knows I like my steak medium well. I don't want it bloody. Pink is okay, not bloody. She knows this. We've been married a long time. But she's mad. So she comes over and she kind of throws the plate on the... She doesn't throw it, but kind of abruptly puts it on the table, makes a big noise. And I cut into it and that steak's bleeding. And it was just that switch inside just flipped. And I picked up that plate like a baseball player would pick up a ball or pitcher. And I whipped it up with this huge field stone f uh, fireplace in this log cabin. And I whipped it up against there and that plate broke into 100 pieces and the steak went flying. My golden retriever was a beeline for the steak, right? And I kind of laughed because, you know, you don't expect that. You're, you're angry, but your golden retriever is like bounding for the steak, right? Because in, in like three bites, it's gone. I'm laughing, right? And I turned around and my three-year-old daughter standing right beside me, literally shaking and her eyes full of water. And I thought to myself, this is not the kind of person I want to be. This is not the kind of dad I want to be. This is not the kind of husband I want to be. And I knew something had to happen. I knew something had to change and I knew it had to change in me. It wasn't them. And so three months later, the sobriety thing happened and then, but that was a big moment that really kind of put that seed in my head that something's got to happen or else you're not going to make it. Um, so the three months later, the sobriety happens, 11 days into that, I'm laughing. Five days after that, I leave treatment and I do everything they ask me to do. Um, I, I literally did everything they told me to do because whatever they were doing was working for me. And, and I tried over 500 ways to get sober, couldn't do it. For me to get sober was absolutely impossible because of all the different ways I tried it. I would be like, come on, God, just let's just do this thing. Let's just get it over with. Let's get, you know, just help me stop. Nothing, right? Um, I tried the storage facility. I mean, I can't tell you how many different ways I tried. And... Um, when I started doing what they started telling me and when, that, and when they told me in treatment, you know, that your best thinking got you here, I was like, wow, they're right. My grand plan did get me here in a treatment center in Detroit and with a mullet. Okay, it, it was not a pretty patient. But for me, to, in the core of every one of my fibers in my body, my heart and my soul, and like I said, I never blame God, I never stopped believing in God. 
but I knew I just knew it was impossible to get sober for me it was just not gonna happen try too many ways then it happened well once it happened 30 days into it you know your head clears up a little bit my head cleared up probably for 24 months it got clearer and clearer and clearer after 30 days it's cleared up quite a bit from what it was I started to realize that now anything is possible because that was impossible and not only am I sober but I'm happy and I'm laughing because if I'm miserable and sober, I might as well just go drink, okay? It does, or, or whatever it is. Food, doesn't matter what it is. And, and you know, I thought, like, the, you know, like you saw in the video, what do you do to make things right? Well, some things you can't make right. Some things you, you screw up so bad, you just can't make them right. And, you know, I was like going to do the comeback and I left treatment. I was, you know, 255 pounds. My skin was yellow um, because my liver was so stressed and um, I was a train wreck. Um, and at 255, I looked like a beanpole. And, you know, people that had remembered me that were in treatment, you know, they were like, wow, I mean, this guy used to be huge and he used to wreck people and, and now he looks frail and all this stuff. And, I, and then I also thought, I didn't even think about going back to the NFL because I was like, that's behind me, that's done. And, and I just don't, you know, they're not going to take me back. I, I burnt all those bridges, burnt all of those bridges. And um, at about four or five months of training, my, and, I'll, and I'll step back just a little bit. You get a counselor in treatment and you only get him or her for two to four weeks, however long you're there. Mine happened to be female. She said to me, because um, athletics was part of your background, um, it wouldn't hurt to, if you got back into some kind of, you know, intramural sport or if you just started lifting again a couple times a week just because you enjoy it. She said, and just understand, and she was crystal clear, she was great. She said, that's not going to keep you sober. She said, but it's going to, if you feel better about yourself physically, it's going to help. And if you enjoy doing it. Well, what I heard was work out like a maniac seven days a week okay that's what i heard so i did and by fourth and fifth month of sobriety i was back up to 300 pounds and and, and getting my strength back and in that first couple weeks i was like I'll never be 300 pounds because you can't do it like this body can't do it without steroids. And then that second thought came into my mind. Well, you said the same thing about sobriety and it happened. So I was like, you know what? It's just a matter of putting the plan on paper, doing. I knew what it took. I knew what you had to do. And, um, and I was 300 pounds in six months and got a tryout. I called my agent and the last time my agent saw me I was a train wreck and, and um, I said, you know, I, I'd like to make a comeback to the NFL and those the awkward silence on the phone, right? Because he didn't want to get embarrassed. And um, he said, well, before you do that, I'd like you to drive down to Cleveland and see me so we can sit down and talk. I think he just wanted to look into my eyes to see if they were clear or not. And, and when I walked in, he's like, oh, my God, you know, he's like, what happened? He's like, this is the guy that used to play in college. Like, this is the Tony that I remember. And I said, well, I said, this is what happened. And um, so he got a tryout. I got a tryout with Philadelphia. And Philadelphia, this is January. Philadelphia scout is flying through Cleveland from the West Coast. He's got a six-hour layover, and then he's going back to Philly. And, and they say, we'll give you a workout at this local community college just outside of Cleveland. Um, it'd be like working out at Scottsdale Community College in their gymnasium. And um, while the scouts got the layover. And for, so for me, it was like a nine hour drive. 
And I had to laugh to myself because that was 1996. In 1989, I didn't even go to the combine. I held my own combine at Michigan State. Because when you're in the top two or three or four picks, you can call a lot of shots because you have leverage. And now it was like the polar opposite. I was grateful to have an opportunity to drive nine hours and go work out at some community college and even just get a look. I have a pretty good workout. The scout's like, where have you been? And I'm like, it's a long story. And so he goes back to Philly. He tells Ray Rhodes, who was one of my coaches in Green Bay, we got to fly him in and work him out in Philly. In the meantime, Indianapolis hears that I heard had a good workout. And they fly me down two days later, and I work out for them. And I had a great workout uh, on the field workout and in the weight room and told them the whole story. I said everything. I said, you know, I'm going to be as transparent. I said, you're buying, you're getting down. If you invest in this, it's damaged goods, just so you know. And um, they, uh, I got, and I, I went in the locker room and I was getting ready to take all my stuff off, my grays that they give you to work out in. And I was going to shower and meet with them and then get on the plane back to Michigan. And they came in, the scout came in he said, with a contract and he said, he goes, we want to sign you to a two-year deal. And it was like the movie Matrix. It was like everything stopped, right? And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? that this is actually happening. Because 11 months prior to that, it was impossible to get sober, it was impossible to get off the couch. I was showering once a week because it was a chore. I was throwing plates up against fireplaces, burned all my bridges in the NFL. And at that moment, you know, all that stuff goes through your head and the two biggest things that went into my head was there's only two reasons this thing happened because of AA and more importantly because of God because without those two things I never would have got this opportunity so <clears throat> and you know I I don't want to say I didn't do anything. Yeah, I worked my ass off. But really, you know, I was given a chance. And that's all I needed was the chance. And if I had the chance, I wasn't going to let it slip away. And I was going to do it right this time. And I did it right. And I kept my mouth shut. And Indianapolis was a fantastic place to play. And, you know, got to play with some unbelievable people. Got the 12 steps, some unbelievable people. Um, got to play with Peyton Manning for two years for, with Marshall Falk, Marvin Harris, and all those guys. Regular guys, just regular guys, except extremely competitive and very talented. But otherwise, just good guys. And. I left Green Bay, I mean, I left Indianapolis. Oh, I retired with a shoulder injury and stayed there, became a financial advisor for Morgan Stanley for a year and a half. And then when the dot-com boom happened and stuff started falling apart, I realized I wasn't that good a financial advisor because um, everything I was buying before was making money, but now it's not. So I was like, I don't like this business. So I got out of that and then went back home to Canada. But there was a bigger picture to the whole thing. There was a guy in Indianapolis, a very crucial guy with the Indianapolis Colts, who I ended up sponsoring for three years. And when that happened, and I looked back, and this guy was vital because he had the ability to reach people that were untouchable to all of us, or most of us. And I thought, you know what? Part of the sobriety for me was to slay my demons. But the bigger picture was also to help him slay his demons and to put him on his way and, and to help other people, which he did. And 
and, and you know there's a, you know the saying in the 12 step in AA is the only you know basically in a nutshell it's like the only way you can keep it is by giving it away I mean you got it and it it's you know what the 12 steps and and there's people in here that are in 12 step programs the 12 steps uh, it's just do the right thing pretty much you know it's stuff that you could take out of the Bible everything in the 12 steps you learn in kindergarten you literally learn in kindergarten you learn how to share you learn how to be kind nowhere does it say anything about nap time although I think it should <laughs> and you know it's it's simple it's it's really simple and you know today you know and I don't want to use a cliche that I really do live the dream life because I do what I love to do and I I do my passion so when I go to work it's not I mean I get tired but it's not work and if I work a 10 or 12 hour day or 15 hour day or 16 hour day or a four hour day, you know, some days are different than others, but I'm doing what I love to do, okay, in photography. And you can create anything that comes out of this bad neighborhood, okay? So all my life's experiences that I've had, I've gotten now, I get to project with other athletes and how to portray them and because I mostly shoot athletes now um, although I do other stuff but I had a friend I was doing a test shoot on a Sunday at my studio and I was just testing just testing stuff testing lights seeing this how this works seeing how this works to get better and my phone rings it's my buddy's like what are you doing I said I'm at the studio he's like oh I'm sorry you know, I'm sorry you have to be at the studio on a Sunday. And I was like, why? Are you sorry? He's like, well, you got to work. And I was like, I want to be here. This is what I love to do. And that started to make me realize that most people don't do what they love. You know, it's 80, was there's statistics like 87% of the people hate their job and 95% of them are afraid of losing it. You know, it doesn't make sense. And the other 3% are the ones that own the companies, right? The, that are the bosses. So I, I will sacrifice monetary for passion any day of the week. And, and I, when I left Canada, I was making 300 grand a year in the golf course business. And I moved down here because I loved Arizona. It, was, it felt good on the arthritis with the heat and the lack of humidity. And I just love mountains. And I love photography. I was like, I'm starting a photography business. And I made 35 grand the first year. And I was as happy as could be. And you know, now after 10 years, the business has grown pretty, pretty good. And um, I've gotten to meet some phenomenal people. And when you start looking back at your life, you start to ask yourself, okay, at 48, and as Mark and I have talked, my cardiologist has said to me this, okay? She's, because she, I'm about 300 pounds. And yeah, I could, there's, there's some fat I could lose. I know you can't tell, but there's some fat I could lose. And she says to me, even though you work out and stuff, she's like, you should start thinking about dropping weight because you're 46. This was two years ago. And she said, and people that played your position in the NFL are dropping like flies after 45, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, whatever, because they're not taking care of themselves. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm working out. She's like, yeah, you are, but you're 300 pounds. And she's like, I don't care if you're 300 pounds with 5% body fat, your heart still has to pump for 300 pounds. And I was like, yeah. And then the one that hit me was, how many 80 year old men do you see walking around that are 300 pounds? <laughs> and I was like, none. And she said, she just looked at me and she's like a buck 10, right? Irish. 
and she's got that accent and she was like all like smart alecky with me and I was like shit you know I was like you know some stuff's got to go you know some pizza and wings got to start getting cut out and stuff like that but you know it, it's it's funny when you start to see that because it's if you want the, that quality of life that's something you have to do and here I am two years later and I'm maybe a pound lighter and, <laughs> and I don't want to go in and see her right what I'm gonna do is do a crash two-week diet before my appointment and come in at 280 and be like yeah I'm feeling good um, but you know the whole thing, and, I, and I'm going to close with this, and, and I'll take questions as long as you want, but the whole thing for me, the way I describe it, is if you have a wheel of a bike, and you have all the spokes, okay, and all the spokes are all the different areas of your life, and whether one is your character, your one's integrity, uh, one can be your job, one can be uh, your uh, being a father, one can be you know, being a husband, um, doesn't matter what it is, okay, we've all got all those roles to play, okay, but you're in the middle of that thing, okay, so usually when I draw it up on a whiteboard if I if I do a presentation for like I'll do a presentation in two or three weeks up at Exos for all the guys that are gonna get drafted and I'm gonna basically not give them this talk but a similar talk to basically what happened but I'll say that middle part is you but really that middle part is God because everything that goes in your life is associated to me and God okay without that involved in it God is involved in my sex life God is involved in my work God is involved in every aspect of my life okay and so the stronger that we and if I start to veer on one of those and not invite God into it that spoke goes away and that wheel gets weaker so for me, that foundation, and to keep that foundation strong, is key. Because in almost 20 years of sobriety, there were times where I was, ha where I was happier at like seven, eight, nine years than I was at 14, 15, 16. Because I was more spiritually connected. I was closer to God. Whatever I was doing, maybe I was going to more meetings, maybe I was hitting my knees more and praying and asking for help. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Whatever it was, you know, time is, it does have some value to it, but I don't want to be just dry and miserable. I, I want to be sober and happy. So, you know, the foundation of all that comes back to, for me, the core, and, the, and, and I think the whole core of any 12-step program is God. And they call it your higher power. They don't want to call it Buddha or Allah or God or Jesus Christ or whatever they call it. And I'm like, I don't care what you call it. I know what it is and it works. And, you know, I choose to call it, you know, God the Father. And, you know, that's my interpretation. Um, but without that foundation in my life, my life is weaker and more at risk. More, it's, it's more at risk of me drinking. It's more at risk of me having behaviors that will lead me to drinking. And, um, and, 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 and you know, listen, it's... You'd have to be naive to think that anybody's got a perfect life. I, I, if you ever want to know about relationships, don't come to me, okay? I'm the last person you want to talk to. I can give you some fundamentals, but I'm going to point you to somebody who's been married for 40 years and is happy with his wife. Because I'm going to say, that's the guy I want to ask because he apparently is doing something right. Don't ask me, divorce twice. So, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough to realize, hey, I know, how to not, I know how not to drink. I know how to put a plan together. I know how to execute a plan. I know how to work. I'm not allergic to it. 
I know how to be true to myself, okay? But I still need you because if I sit there and talk to myself, it's a bad conversation, right? It's a bad neighborhood, right? It's a dark alley. And it's like, you know what? You can do this, you know? And I'm like, you know, well, I did hit my knees this morning and I did ask God for guidance and direction, but she does look pretty good, you know? Or, you know, maybe I could have one drink or whatever the case may be. So I have to have, it was one of the only things in my life I couldn't do by myself was to get sober. I, actually were, I needed actual other people to help me because I needed them to share their story and help me. Everything else I set my mind to, I could do, and, and, and a lot of people did help me do other things, but I could do it without their help. I couldn't get sober without other people's help. And that showed me, you know, how powerful that was. Um, you know, when I read this thing, that you guys had on the table and you know it says sex porn money alcohol power abuse drugs god divorce and i was like yeah um, i was like yeah 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 <laughs> twice <laughs> so you know if, if uh, um I'm, high, I'm, I'm really a big proponent of be true to yourself because if you're not, you're not going to be happy. And sometimes being true to yourself, you're going to hurt people. And that's the hard part. But you know what? If you're not happy, what, what else does anything else matter? You know, you got to be, you got to be happy. And you got to be true to yourself and you got to follow your passions and you got to know you got to know that anything is possible anything is possible absolutely anything if someone would have told me the day before i went into that treatment center that in 11 months i'd be back in the nfl i would have said you're crazy and i would have slurred it if someone would have told me that you would have been the second pick in the draft. You know, I kind of knew it. I mean, I knew it as long as I didn't get hurt or something. I said, I could, but everybody else was laughing at me. And I was like, it's okay. Keep laughing. And I'm just going to keep walking and keep working. And I'll be the first one there and the last one to leave. And I'll do all the stuff. And um, so, so now it's, you know, it's follow your passion. You know, I hit my knees every morning. I don't go to church a lot. I don't think I go to church at all, as a matter of fact. Um, I haven't been to, actually, the last time I went to church, I took my mom about a year and a half ago. And I have nothing against going to church. And when I first got sober, I used to criticize Catholicism because it didn't work for me. And then a guy in AA, this guy, he looked like Mick. Rocky's trainer Mick he was salty he was mean and he walked up to me after the meeting because I said something s smart alecky like I'm a recovering alcoholic and a recovering Catholic and people chuckled right I thought I was cool I was five months sober and he walked up to me and he said what makes you an authority on Catholicism he said it works for millions of people he goes, just because it didn't work for you, you don't have to, you know, dog it. And I was like, wow. I was like, you're right. And I was supposed to hear that. And there's a, there's a lot of things that work for a lot of different people. If there's people in AA that think that AA is the only way to get sober, and it's BS. There's a lot of different ways to get sober. It just so happened that AA worked for me. So then a lot of the other things didn't. So I stuck with what worked, but I knew the core fundamental of the whole thing. Without God, nothing else mattered. Okay, so again, it all comes back to that core. So, Rick, thanks so much for having me. Th guys, thanks for listening to me. Hey guys, um, yeah, let's give Tony another applause. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. 
We're going to take some questions. Um, you know, Tony, you know, said that we could give him some questions, and um, there's no there's no categories that are off limits. Nothing's off limits, so let's go for it. We're sitting on the bed, you leave the smoking room, I'll let you off, chew you off, I'll let you off, we're sitting on the bed, and I'll still start laughing. Well, what it was was, when we were in that room, we were sharing stories about all the BS we did. Like I'd be talking to a guy that worked for the municipality who ran a backhoe. And he would talk about how he would go at lunch and go to the bar and he's supposed to take like a 45 minute, you know, break. And he's like three hours later, he comes back, to, you know, to dig the trench and all the other construction workers are working. Right? So we're laughing about all that. And I'm telling him about hopping the fence. So we're sharing all these stories. And a lot of the stories have the commonalities of lack of responsibility and stuff like that. So we were laughing so hard in that room. So, and I left the room because my eyes were burning from the smoke, from the cigarette smoke from everybody who was smoking. And I was like, I just gotta get out of this room because my eyes are burning. And then I went and sat on my bed and, and my stomach hurt. And I was like, I haven't felt this feeling, like it's not hurt like I'm gonna throw up. And I'm like, holy smokes, my stomach hurts from laughing. And that's when it was like, the first time in like 10 years that my stomach hurt from laughing. Yeah. Who's got another question? We want to get it on the tape, so I'm going to have you say it in here. Tony, when you were going through all your challenges, did any Christian ministries like Norm Evans Pro Athletes Outreach or Big Mike McCoy, who's a former Green Bay Packer, did they ever reach out to you? You know, there was a lot of people. Those two don't ring a bell. They may have. Do you know who they are? I don't. Okay. Um, they may have reached out to me. I was in such a fog. But I, I know a lot. And, and then, you know, each team has their little cliques. Chapels. Right. And in chapels. And some, you know, you've got the young guys that are running, you know, we call them running and gunning. They're going to all the, the clubs at night because they're super young. Then you got the family guys. And then there's another group who are family guys and have chapel, right? So, and then they have Bible study. Those guys tried to help me. And the, you know they could they knew something was wrong sure. and they did try to help me a lot of people tried to help me you just weren't ready I wasn't ready yeah I wasn't ready but b both those guys are former NFL linemen and one was like you Mike McCoy was the second pick in the draft Terry Bradshaw was front of him in 1970 Wow and he was your size Wow out of Notre Dame Wow <laughs> Terry Bradshaw did pretty good you know, Norm, <laughs> Evans, <laughs> Norm Evans was on that 17 and 0 Miami Dolphins oh. team that every year praises the right, Lord right right and nobody <laughs> when they have that record stick, right, right right he was an offensive tackle yeah, but a lot of uh, a lot of people did try to help and I just wasn't ready, ready. wasn't yeah. ready thanks yeah thank you who else Was there a, a particular time in your life that when you're going through the darkness Maybe a Bible verse or something you learned as a child that kind of popped into your head to maybe give you any kind of optimism. A, a Bible verse, maybe something learned in catechism, or is there something, maybe a, a grandmother, or I, I'm really... My, like, I think my mother's right now on the, probably the latter, probably three quarters of the way through Alzheimer's. She's... Uh, it was hard to see her at Christmas. It was the first time she didn't recognize me. Uh, that was hard. That was really hard. Um, I've always said th that her prayers got me sober because she was such a devout Catholic and is a devout Catholic. And she, when I saw her, she's like, are you going to church every Sunday? And I'm like, yeah, you know, because <laughs> um, I don't, you know. She's not going to remember 20 seconds from now, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there, there wasn't. Uh, the question that was always in my head, unfortunately, it wasn't a Bible verse, but the question was, why me? Why did I get the short end of the stick? And it was kind of, you know, I would ask that internally the same way I would say, why not me? 
when I was like wanted to get drafted and become the best at what I do or when they said only 1% will stay sober the rest of their life I said I didn't say it out loud but I said well yeah why not me if I could do that and if sobriety was impossible and it just happened why not why not why not me be that 1% to stay sober the rest of my life so yeah, so, um, Tony, so you were so driven, obviously, from such a young age, right? You wanted to be, you know, the, the first pick and so on. And, when and, and, I, and I'm, I'm still very driven, and I'm as competitive as anybody. <laughs> if anybody wants to do push-ups right now, <laughs> besides some of these big guys, right? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but but when you got to the NFL, you you couldn't do steroids anymore. You know you need to get caught. So why? What what was the thought process? I'm just curious to to go from steroids or to go from wanting to be the best to now doing drugs and alcohol. Knowing you had to know that that was not going to get you to that goal or not continue that goal, right? Well, how does that? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious. How, what, what was going through your mind at that time? To, well, the whole thing was a facade. Right, the whole, I mean, yeah, you had to work your butt off to, I mean, you don't just like, you know, I'll be honest with you, steroids work. Yeah. They work great. They work great. And they get a bad rap because of the 1% that are meatheads, okay? They work if they're used for the right reasons, okay? Some, you know, elderly people that have weak muscles and they take them and they can now walk, well, it doesn't matter, okay? the the whole thing with me was psychologically a lot of this not all of them but some of the steroids I, I was taking were a big time psychological effect not just a physical effect so it was so powerful that I would get off you know I would get off a four month cycle and I'd be at the gym the next day and I'd look at myself in the mirror and I'd be like I'm getting smaller where in reality, you're still gonna grow for the next two to four weeks because now your natural testosterone is gonna kick in. You're actually gonna get bigger and stronger. But your mind's telling you you're getting smaller. So I was now like the cat's out of the bag. They're gonna see I'm a facade and that I can't do it without steroids. So I had to fill that void of fear and pain by numbing myself and getting out of reality. And the best thing that did it was painkillers and alcohol. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Tony, thank you for coming tonight. Um, my question is, what was it that made you convinced that you needed to go to rehab and what gave you the courage to make that decision to go that first day? Pain, emotional pain. That was probably the number one factor. Um, you know, for the three years prior to the day that I went in, I knew, like I knew, the problem are the drugs and the alcohol. That is the problem. If I remove those from my life, I'll get better. I couldn't stop. I wanted to go to treatment, but if I go to treatment and it hits the media, then they're gonna be like, see, I told you so. Everybody, so my ego was outweighing my emotional pain. My ego was still saying, you're so damn important. You know, you don't want to risk with your name on the front page of the media saying you're in treatment, so just stay with the emotional pain and suck it up, man up. And then there was that, you know, that critical mass that hit where the emotional pain got so bad, I just said, fuck it. I don't care who finds out. I don't care who knows, what knows, anybody knows. I just want to stop living the way I'm living and I'll do anything to stop the way I'm living. So it was, so if it was like one thing, it was the emotional pain. Uh, Tony, you, you shared about uh, three months before you became sober, uh, you had the moment and your daughter witnessed with anger. A lot of men sitting here probably dealt with anger to some degree in their lives. 
how's your daughter reacted to that since and did you ever have a moment to be able to sit down and say the change was God? I, ha I have and actually she was just in town this last weekend um, she did she's in she lives in Vail she's 23 just graduated last year from uh, Northern Arizona that was expensive um, uh, she doesn't remember anything from from that time because you know she was two and a half three so she doesn't remember because I've asked her and and her mom now this is the, the very interesting part her mom and me both went into treatment the same day I went into Brighton Hospital she went into Henry Ford Clinic 30 miles away and we've both stayed sober the whole time which is rare so we didn't stay married we got divorced three years later because we were just two different people but and we've remained very good friends but um i've sat down with her and i've asked her do you remember and i didn't get into too great a detail but i was like do you remember that or do you remember me yelling or this she's like i don't remember any of it and um you know, I, I, me and Amber, her mom, have talked to her a lot about, you know, the predisposition of potentially her and her sister becoming an addict or an alcoholic because both of her parents were, um, and to be careful. Um, my daughter smokes pot and um, and she drinks um, and she's like you know and I, and I just you know listen I was bulletproof at that age and I just tell her you know my story and be careful I said it'll I said it'll creep up on you fast I said you'll be fine you'll be fine and all of a sudden it'll creep up on you and I, and I always tell her because the other one's too young but I tell her I say look if you ever get thrown in jail for drunk driving or anything, I said, call me first before you, well, you only get one call. I said, call me. I'm not going to be mad at you. Don't think I'm going to be mad at you. I, I get it. I understand that the obsession is so great that you've lost control. So don't be afraid to call me because I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm going to come and help you. Now, I might leave her in there. But... I'm not going to be mad at her. So, um, and, and I have talked to her about God, and she's got her beliefs, and, and they're more on the Christian side. Um, uh, and, you know, she's, she's a great kid, she's, uh, but she's a lot like me, and it's, which, you know, there's some traits that are not good. Um, and uh, the key is all the, to take the vices, and channel them into virtues so take the obsession of or whatever you know even though having an obsession or a crazy being crazy driven to work or work out or do something um, even though that may not be healthy you don't get thrown in jail for working out too much right you don't you don't get thrown in jail for working at the office for 16 hours you know so I always say turn my vices or turn your vices into virtues whatever the vice is turn it into a virtue channel it a different way into a different thing for good and um, and you know obviously one of the best things to do is to stop talking about you like myself for me to get out of me as soon as listen I'm not much, but I'm all I talk about, okay? Because I, I love to talk about, you know, people love to talk about themselves. So for me to get out of me, go help somebody. Like me, go help somebody. And start listening to them and say, what can I do to help you? Instead of having that old paradigm shift of what's in it for me. Because I lived 28 years of what's in it for me. And now I've lived the last almost 20 years of how can I help? Because I know that's what's going to keep me sober. During the course of when you were dealing with the depression, everything else that comes along with, with using and abusing, when you went from being on top to 
basically losing it all and then building back up did you ever did you ever lose hope did you ever like consider suicide did you where did, where did your mind go in your darkest days would you say I was definitely more homicidal than suicidal. Okay. Um, I was too selfish to kill myself. I see. You know? Um, it was the darkest, darkest days were the ne when I was shooting up. Okay. And, you know, sticking a needle in my arm and, and mainlining. And I would rationalize it by saying, well, it's a pharmaceutical. I'm not getting it off some guy on the street. Um, those are dark days because I would come to and pass out and come to and pass out and be like, did I take a shot? Because I don't feel it. Because, you know, you build a tolerance. Right. And, you know, and there was times where my wife would be shaking me, trying to wake me up, you know, and um, the paranoia was just, you know, off the charts and everybody was out to get me and... Um, but those deepest, darkest days, I just kept numbing more and more, just more chemical, more chemical, more chemical. And, at, and there were points uh, where I, you know, I just, I did say, you know, screw it. I just want to, I, I, wa I just want to walk away from the, my wife and my kid and just keep walking. And I want to walk and I want to go somewhere where nobody knows my name. You know, whether it's Colombia or Brazil or whatever. It's like where nobody knows my name or nobody cares or nobody. I just wanted to basically get away and crawl into a cave and die. So. Thank you. Last question. Oh, go ahead. We all like to, to say that we don't care what other people think, you know. But, you know, deep down, when people say hurtful things to us, it hurts inside. And I imagine you get a lot of that, where people come up to you, they know your name, right. and they associate it with the bust or failing. Right. How hard is that for you when you have those moments to not Hit be kept down by that? Or kill them, right. absolutely. Because, because that's not what defines you today. Right. You, you're right. a successful man right. today. That's not the behavior I want to retaliate with. So, because now there's been a pretty long stretch of sobriety, and that's happened a lot. It happened yesterday uh, on Facebook. Um, so, I've gotten some pretty good tools um, figured out over the years. Um, one of, you know, one of the foundational ones for me is just kill them with kindness. You know, just be like, you know what, you're right, I was a bust in Green Bay. And, you know, uh, it is what it is and I don't apologize to that person. I've already apologized to the Packers publicly. So I owe that person no apology. So, but then when I'm a little bit more on edge, I'll be like, you know, I'm sorry I don't recognize your name, but what team did you play for? <laughs> you know, and then, you know, and then the guy writes back and he goes, well, okay, you got me there, but you're still a bust. And I'm like, whoa, great comeback, right? And I'm like, loser, block, right? <laughs> I'm like, at least come back with something good that stirs me up more, right? So, you know, it's, it's, uh, but mostly it's kill them with kindness. I got, a, a, about three, four years ago, a lady from, um, she wasn't in Green Bay, but she was in Wisconsin, like Manitowoc, like an hour from Green Bay, I think it was. She wrote me a scathing email, like a private message in Facebook, that talked about how, I mean, literally used the words, like, bust and loser were the good words. Like, pathetic SOB, you know, you're an embarrassment to this whole, I mean, just, I mean, it was, went on, like, for four paragraphs. So I copied it, and I put it on my wall with her name. And then I put a comment, and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't live up to your expectations. And then there was about 700 comments started, like just comment after comment after comment, and just, they were all over her about, you know, you know, and, and you know, there was, I, I would say out of like the 700 comments, there was like four or five people that said, that agreed with her, and the rest were, 
either like, you know, who are you to say this? Or, you know, they were, I mean, my friends are my friends on Facebook, so they're going to back me up. And they were like ripping into her. And then they started ripping into her pictures because she wasn't all that. And I was like, I was like, you know, sending my friends PM messages being like, you know, you can retaliate, but don't, you know, she's got feelings too, right? But, you know, you always think, I'm not going to be somebody's doormat. Okay, none of us should be somebody's doormat. I mean, but we all put our pants on the same way, right? One leg at a time. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, but fortunately, you know, my life was lived on the front page. Okay, how many mistakes did that lady make in her life that nobody knows about because they weren't, I mean, you know, she just lived a regular normal life. It's like all of us make mistakes, right? She ended up PMing me and apologizing and wrote like a paragraph and just saying, you know what, I ranted, I was in a mood and I was wrong for doing it. So I copied it and I put it on my wall. And I was like, if she's, you know, got the, you know, umph to say that and admit that she had made a mistake, then I should post that too. I shouldn't just be biased and show the bad part. And I put that and I, and she's now still my Facebook friend. I mean, we don't talk or nothing, but um, she's kind of like become a fan. Like she sent me football cards to sign for her kids, you know, so it's, you know, it's <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you what I wrote on the football cards, <laughs> no. but but it's it's you know it's kind of like kill him with kindness, you know, and and um, it, it is it is. I think whether you know you have a big disaster in life, or I mean, pain is pain. Everybody shares the same pain when they mess up. I think how you handle that pain defines your character. And how you do that day in and day out, not for three months, not for six months, but for year after year after year. How you live defines your legacy, okay? So, you know, you can, you know, I'll be remembered a lot for the football stuff, but there's a lot of more people that I associate with now that talk about the, nobody talks about the comeback. You know, everybody, people will say, well, nobody talked about the Indianapolis years, or nobody talks about the stuff you've done since. You know, and then they'll show pictures, you know, of Ryan Leaf in prison. And they'll show pictures of Jamarcus Russell screwing up and, and all these high draft choices that have screwed up. And, and they're like, you know, yeah, but he wasn't as bad as them. And I'm like, you know, you don't build me up by tearing them down. It's like, we almost flew to Dakota, wherever Ryan Leaf was when he went to jail, to go see him. And just to visit him and say, hey look, do you want help? Because if you do, we'll stay and we'll talk to you. If you don't, we'll leave. Because I know where you're at. I've never been to jail. Not because I didn't do anything illegal, I just didn't get caught. But I know the pain that you have. So if you want help, we'll sit down and talk to you. Um, and w we couldn't go because the jail wouldn't let you. It was weird. It was really weird because of who he was. And it was like, yeah. but you know, it's day in and day out. What do you do? How do you live? Day in and day out. How do you live? You're gonna make mistakes. How do you live? How do you live? How do you live? What do you keep doing? Right? Every day, am I getting better? Am I self-improving? Am I making myself better? Am I making the people around me better? You know, there's that old saying, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need to change groups because you're not gonna grow. So I've never been the smartest one in my group, so I've always stayed in a group. But, um, but, but I like the saying, right? It's a true saying. If you're the smartest one in your group, you should change groups because otherwise you're not gonna grow. Right, you're not gonna grow. How, how are you gonna grow? You have to learn from other people. And, um, but you know, for me now, it's, it's defining the legacy. A dear, dear friend of mine, who I spoke at his funeral two weeks ago, uh, died 
from a heart attack on New Year's, I mean on a Christmas Eve day. Uh, his name was Dr. Uh, no pun intended, his name was Johnny Walker, Dr. Johnny Walker. Phenomenal human being. He was an internist. Worked at Scottsdale Osborne. And he was 54, in good shape. It just dropped. He had chest pain for four days. And you know, the doctor is his own worst doctor. He was popping in acids and heartburn and this and that. And, and uh, he just dropped in his house. And you never know when it's gonna happen, right? So, you know, when I was, I was asked to speak at his funeral with a bunch of other people, his colleagues, and all I could talk about was, hey, look, I knew Johnny for six years. And his legacy to me is this, what he did every day of those six years. He was constantly about helping people. And it wasn't just as a doctor, it was as a human being, which is what impressed me. And he was, he was a great example. Um, and it was like, it, it blew me away that he was gone. It, it just blew me away and it saddened me so much. And I was like, it's just not fair. It's just not fair, but I'm not God, so. I mean, once I thought I was, you know, and it almost killed me. And, um, but it, it's, it's how I live every day now is what my character is. You know, one of those sayings that I love that is very true, that everybody's heard, what are you doing when nobody's watching? Right? In sports, it was like, what are you doing when, when nobody's watching? Are you shooting free throws? Are you in the gym? Are you doing agility drills for your position? Are you doing skip rope? Are you boxing? Whatever, right? It's like, what are you doing when the cameras are not around, when the coaches are not around? Are you watching more film? What are you doing then? Because that's what starts to define you, and that's how you start to live because it becomes a habit and that's how you live. And, um, and not to get off that, but listen, I hate the Patriots. I've never beat them, okay? I hate the Patriots. <laughs> but they're not, they're not a mistake. They're, they're that good for a reason because day in and day out, they do it. And, and, and it comes from Kraft and it comes from Belichick and then it, it just trickles down and they all do it and they all keep each other accountable and when your peer makes you accountable then it's you know even more serious business because you know obviously you're superior you expect to but when the guy beside you is calling you out on your stuff that's when it really opens your eyes all right Thank you so much for being here. I did not have a chance to meet him before. He's probably like, who's this guy walking up with a mic? I have, a, I have great feeling and love for anybody named Tony. Number one, number one, my wife's name is Tony, with an I. And uh, I'm Italian, so we got a lot of Tonys in my family. And my Uncle Tony, how many have an Uncle Tony? Uh, we're a couple. Uh, my Uncle Tony, I love him because he let me drive when I was 12. So uh, nothing like driving with your tw when you're 12 with your Uncle Tony. Uh, and other things happen with Uncle Tony that weren't so good. But uh, uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, one of the things you'll learn about this meeting is you'll hear a lot of different things. You might hear uh, stories from a lot of different kinds of people. You know, we walked in here tonight. You may have noticed some really nice cars. How many of you like that Ferrari sitting back there underneath the lights? Uh, uh, that Ferrari was designed by somebody before it ever became a car, before they even had parts. It was designed not only in the mind of someone, but it was, it was formulated and designed for a purpose. But if you also notice, when you walked in outside, there's a Ford Fusion out there. Really nice Ford Fusion. If I were to say to you, you can have one, either one of those cars, I think most of you would choose the Ferrari. And someone's calling me. Sorry, Mom, I'll call you back. Uh, but the difference, this is, the, this is very interesting and it's really important, is that that Ferrari and what it was designed for and that, that Ford Fusion sitting out front, 
If we were to line it up just a couple days ago, how many of you remember how foggy it was? I'm, I'm from the East Coast, and if you go up to New England, you get hit some really foggy days. And when you're riding on a, a really foggy day, and you have that Ferrari, and we had that Ford, Ford Fusion side by side, guess what? They'll both go about as fast as, as equally, as, as equal that they can possibly go. Even though the potential within the Ferrari is to leave it in the dust, is to blow it away, is to take it to a, a place that, that you would never even see again. But in the fog, it never sees or realizes its potential. You know, one of the things he talked about tonight was, was, a, was a before and after and the story that's still being written in his life. I, how many of you know that God has a plan and purpose for his life? There are some people here that are just a memory to us because they didn't survive. They didn't make it through to the other side. They didn't make it past addiction. They didn't make it past making a choice or a change in their life. How many of us know someone who unfortunately didn't make it past if you're struggling, the fact that you're here tonight is a, is a sign from me and it's a sign to all of us here that there is a God in heaven and he's merciful and he's gracious and he's loving and he sees past our faults. He sees past where we are and he sees past us being designed even like a Ferrari and we're living like we're a, a 69 bug driving in the fog. But he loves us that much to say, you know what, I'm still here. I'm still reaching out. I love how the songwriter wrote, he says, uh, uh, his love never fails, it never gives out, it never, it never, it never gives up on me, and it never gives up on you. You know, there's a man in the Bible, his name was Saul originally, Saul of Tarsus, but then he has a suddenly moment in his life. He has a moment in his life on the road to Damascus where he's, he's taken off guard, and, and some of you know the story, but if you don't, he was a guy that hated Christians. Not only did he create it, he was an enemy of God, not just because of, of not believing in God, but he was an enemy because he was out to go after Christians. He was there when the apostle Stephen was stoned. Can you imagine being there for anybody being stoned? Can you imagine being there where, the, where Stephen is actually preaching a message, is refusing to give up what he believes? He's got that much passion in him, and yet Paul's on the other side ringing and, and, and just cheering this on. And Paul says, I was one of those guys who was not only didn't believe God and did my own thing, but he had, that, he had those goals, he had that vision. He was an educated man. And Paul sat there and he watched this, but there was a suddenly moment when God illuminated himself to Paul. The Bible says that it was during the noonday hour that a light shined so bright from heaven that it just completely overtook him. And, he, and his voice comes down and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's almost like the Godfather say, hey, what are you, what, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? What have you been doing all this? So, you, you know, who, who do you think you are? And nobody else really recognized what was being said, but I want you to hear this. Paul heard everything because it was a message from God for Paul. And I want you to know in our lives, there's a message. God will get a message through to us. Even maybe nobody else recognizes, nobody else knows what's going on. Maybe on our facade, everything else on the outside might look good. But let me tell you something, the creator of all heaven and the one that's designed you knows exactly where you are. And he calls out to Paul, and Paul responds, and he does this complete turnaround and transformation. Paul's life is so transformed, do you realize if he never changes direction, we lose 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. We lose him teaching and training that we hang our lives on as, as church and as ministries. We wouldn't have seen the, the gospel and the, and the testimony of Jesus go to the Gentiles and go all throughout the world. Inside of you, there's a mission and a purpose. We talked about it tonight. It was a great example you gave about the wheel. There's components to each one of our lives. We're all wearing different hats. But if you're never connected to the one who designed you, the one who has a purpose and a plan for your life, it will never flow correctly. If we think we can white knuckle through addiction or we can white knuckle through problems or trying to overcome some of the stuff that we just keep failing in and failing in and failing in, we will never do it. We need him. How many want to say amen to that? 
I do believe that there is a supernatural power that only comes from God. I do believe that God puts us in family. He puts us together. He puts us around people to help us through because we were never designed to do life by ourselves. If you're here tonight, I want to encourage you while we heard this great story tonight that there is, if you are struggling with something, I want to encourage you that there is hope. That God knows exactly where you are and your, your prayers have not gone unanswered. And maybe this isn't your, I don't know if your suddenly moment is tonight or maybe it's tomorrow, but I want to encourage you to not give up. I want to encourage you to find some place to plug into. To don't just do it by yourself. Find another guy that you can connect to who's, who's well beyond where you are. I love that example of saying, hey, look, you know what? Don't come to me for weight advice. I'm not the guy to give weight advice. If you want to know how to eat and cook, I can help you with that. <laughs> right? Let's just be honest. But find somebody that you can connect to to help get free and begin to live the life of passion that you were designed by God to live. Otherwise, your life will eventually come to an end. Like everybody in here. No one will ever escape that. You have a moment in time. I'm, I'm going to be 45 in uh, March. The beginning of March, I'll be 45. I can't believe that I'm going to be 45. It seems like it was only yesterday I graduated high school in 1988. It does not seem that long ago. I was recently listening to songs my daughter was listening to. It was like a remake from a song from the 80s. And how many of you, like, you hear an old song, all of a sudden there's lyrics come right back? I'm like, ah, oh, this isn't, you should have heard the original. Original was good. This is like crap, okay? They're destroying a good song. And I'm like, oh my Lord, I've turned into my father. <laughs> Guys, it goes quick. It goes quick and you, you, have, you have something inside of you that, that is meant to be given out to other people in this world. I just want to encourage you not to waste it. Give your life to God. Give everything. Keep him at the center and you'd be surprised what he can do. He takes broken things and he can put them back together again. I love what, what Jesus said. He said, I, I came for those that needed a physician. I, he, I, he didn't come for everybody that thought they were perfect and had it all together. If you think you're going to get it all together and then somehow be able to do great stuff, you got it all backwards. That's not how it works. We come just as we are. And then he, he has the ability to take something and make something out of nothing. We're going to close in prayer. And um, why don't we just thank Tony one more time for being here tonight. Thank you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this night. We thank you that we can gather and, and, and share stories, share our story and, and share the process that we're in and, and hear where you've taken Tony from and where you're taking him to. And yet, God, there's chapters that are yet to be written. We pray as men here tonight, we lift up our brother. We just pray your continued protection over him and over his family, that you continue to write his story and continue to allow him to make an impact in this world that you've designed for him to make. We pray for your continued health and, and favor and the, the things that he puts his hand to that you would continue to guide and direct his steps and that Lord that he would live a fulfilled not only just passionate but fulfilled awesome life through to the end and Lord for those other ones that maybe are in this place maybe you have come here tonight I want to encourage you to you don't have to come up front here but you can just reach out to God right where you are you don't even have to say it or scream it but even in your heart and your mind as you're going home tonight, you can lift up a prayer and God does hear you. I want you to know that God has not passed us by, but he is still alive and well. He is still working in the lives of men and women all over this world and changing stories every single day. Lord, I pray that you would be with every single man in here, that we would embrace and hear what you've had to say to us. Lord, maybe the one or two things that you want us to take away from this night, maybe it's giving our lives to you for the first time. And if you've never done that, I, I just encourage you. It's real, it's, it's real simple to step, step towards God. You know, he doesn't make it real hard, but you could say with me in your heart, you could say, you know, Lord, please forgive me. 
forgive me of me trying to do life my own way and trying to white knuckle it, but Lord, I, I do believe that, that you're all powerful and all knowing that you did go to the cross and die for me because I was a sinner. I, I, I needed a savior. And Lord, I believe that you did raise again after the third day. And Lord, I want my life to be rooted and grounded with you at the center. I don't want any other foundation but you, Lord. And maybe if you're here tonight and maybe you've just been kind of wavering or you've been looking for direction, I encourage you to seek after the Lord. The Bible says if we do seek after him, we seek after him with our whole heart. If you really, really want to find him, you will find him. And be tenacious, be passionate, and don't give up until you find him. We thank you, Lord, for this night. I pray you would take us home safely and bring us back next week, Lord, and that this week we would look for opportunities to live a great life and do great things and even do things for others as we see those needs arise. In Jesus' name, amen.